X399. What about X399M? And the M stands for Micro ATX with the recent release of ASRock's Tai Chi motherboard. Pretty much the fully featured Tai Chi, but now cut off at the bottom to accommodate Micro ATX builds. Now, the first thing that comes to mind when I think of a motherboard like this is that John's Bow small Micro ATX case, the UMX3. Would I love to put this in that and make a build? And I've just ordered that case right now, so maybe stay tuned for that build. But today we're gonna to focus on the Tai Chi M motherboard, what it features, and of course, is it worth your money? Let's take a look. Welcome back to Tech Yes City. This is Brian coming to you guys today with the Tai Chi M motherboard here, the X399 version, and it's got the 1950X Threadripper CPU in it. However, this time around, there was one big problem I ran into, and that was with the previous H100 V1 cooler that I had, the hose busted off in between moving some things. So out of all the coolers I have around here, and I do have a lot, I could no longer get a cooler to fit the TR4 socket. So I had to improvise a little bit, get a bit uh, creative, and I mounted the CPU cooler down with a monitor arm. And it did work, it did work pretty well. Uh, however, with that, I didn't really want to overclock. So today's tests will be on the stock 3.4 gigahertz, which is already very impressive for 16 cores, 32 threads. And we're gonna take a look at the VRM temperatures. Now the VRM on the Tai Chi M motherboard features a 11 phase, but with eight phases dedicated to the CPU itself. And these are IR3555, 60 amp dual stage MOSFETs. So you got the high side and the low side integrated into one of these chips and you get eight of them dedicated towards your CPU. Also, you got 60 amp chokes. And the best thing is you got Tandalum POS cap capacitors. These are pretty much the best in the biz. So ASRock have went full ball with this VRM and the results show in the past, and I'll put the link in the description below when I tested the X399 motherboards, the ASRock Fatality Ball, which features the same VRM, had no problems at all getting a four gigahertz stable in less than ideal ambient temperatures. So this here, when I put the uh, thermal imaging camera on it, the VRM on the heatsink wise, it got to around about 60 degrees. And then on the actual MOSFETs itself, it was reading up to about 90 degrees. This was in about 28 degrees ambient temperatures during the dead heat of summer. So the temperatures on this VRM are really good for handling anything you throw at it, especially on air or everyday water overclocks. And now with this motherboard, we did mention 11 phases and we've only mentioned eight dedicated towards the CPU. The other three are dedicated towards the system on chip or otherwise known as the sock voltage. This is important for getting your memory overclocks right with the course on Ryzen and Threadripper, your memory overclocks being important for your overall system speed, especially if you're a gamer. And so you've got three phases dedicated towards that and the memory itself. Now you notice probably with this motherboard, there are a few little compromises in making it smaller. That's the DDR4 RAM slots. You'll notice that previously on the Taichi you had eight, you've now got four, but you actually have these same amount of phases. I think you've got four phases dedicated towards the DDR4 memory on this. So you'll accommodate up to 64 gigabytes of standard DDR4 storage, but I believe with Threadripper, since it does support ECC memory, you can actually have up to 256 gigabytes if you have the right memory chips. And then to the right of those four DIMM slots, you've got the Dr. Debug LED readout. This is important for diagnosing problems. For instance, if you've got, like I did, a pre-release BIOS version, then you can read the codes and see if, for instance, you maybe need to only put one stick of memory in, update the BIOS, or try a different stick of memory out. This debug LED will tell you that on the fly. You've also got the power and reset button included, although there are smaller buttons, of course, to accommodate this smaller motherboard. Though you do have three slots of NVMe M.2 storage available. You can RAID these within the BIOS itself. So if you wish to make a RAID 0 array on the already incredibly fast M.2, you can with this motherboard. Now the heatsink as well. I forgot to mention the heatsink. That weighs in at 300 grams as well. So if you want to put a fan on this thing for higher overclocks, you can indeed do so. I have heard of people getting these things to 4.2, even 4.3 gigahertz on water since your 1950Xs are indeed in the top 5% of bin Ryzen chips. On top of that, your power delivery for this board, you've got the standard eight pin connector, but you've also got an additional four pin. Now the reason for this is of course, for not just higher overclocks, but in case some ATX uh, power supplies only support the minimum 115 watts per four pins. So essentially on your standard ATX power supply, you can only have 230 watts of deliverance. And now when I've overclocked these in the past, the 1950X, it has gone over 230 watts. 
But having an additional 115 watts available, just in case your power supply, for instance, doesn't have thick enough wires, is always a great peace of mind to have. Moving further down the board, you've got two USB 3 front out headers and also two USB 2 front outs. There's also an RGB header as well if you wish to control your RGB lighting from the motherboard itself. And on that note of the RGB control, you can control it from the BIOS or ASRock's own software program, which does update itself as well automatically, which is a great touch. The heatsink, the Southbridge heatsink, also has its own RGB lighting underneath that heatsink, which again can be controlled via the motherboard's BIOS or the software in Windows. Now going further through the important headers on this motherboard, you've got five four pin PWM controlled fan headers as well. This has enabled you to control your fan speeds in the BIOS itself. And then you can save that to a profile. I've been using this since 2014 on ASRock boards, does a phenomenal job, never once come into a problem. As opposed to some other motherboards in the past, I have come into problems with the PWM control, mainly in the fact that it was an annoyance. This motherboard, you set the profiles in, you're gonna get no annoyances with fans dynamically changing at certain temperatures. They just stick to that profile and they work really well. Great. Now moving further along the bottom of the motherboard, you've got the clear CMOS button, which preferably I'd like to see move to the back of the motherboard as you do have to open up your case if you wanna reset the BIOS in that regard. Great if you're an overclocker, so I'd like to see that move to the back if possible. But of course with the M motherboard, there is that excuse of the space limitations. You've also got two front audio outs here, one that's shaped or 90 degree angled and another that's just your straight fan header out sort of approach. I don't know why they've included this, uh, maybe because people like cable management nowadays, but they've got two of them there and that's connected to the Purity Sound 4. Now when I've tested this sound and I always do audio tests when I look at motherboards, the crosstalk was pretty good on this motherboard, but it still does suffer from that same uh, problem that I've diagnosed in practically every single motherboard that's come through here on the channel. And that is past a volume level of 90, it introduces some crosstalk, in this case, uh, some bumping crosstalk on the right channel. And you can see that in the testing software itself. Also on this motherboard specifically, there was about five decibels higher crosstalk on the right channel than there was on the left channel though the results were still phenomenal. If you were using a mid-range can, for example, you're gonna have a great time on this onboard audio. I don't really see the need or reason to upgrade to a higher DAC amp combo, unless of course you've got higher end headphones, but on the note of the frequency response, absolutely phenomenal. Extremely flat all the way from 10 hertz up to 20 kilohertz. If we look at the low range below 10 hertz, uh, there's still only literally like a two or three decibel drop off. This is some of the most impressive figures I've seen coming out of a motherboard to this date. So great job on the frequency response. And going through the back of the motherboard, you get 10 USB slots, eight of which are USB 3, one of which is USB 3.1a and another which is USB type C. You also get dual band wireless, a PS2 combination port, and also a BIOS flashback button. There's also support for optical out on your audio or 5.1 channel manual surround sound. And last but not least, you get dual one gigabit per second Intel NIX integrated into this motherboard. Of course, the Fatality series of these motherboards have that 10 gigabits per second solution if you need that. So anyway guys, there it is with the X399M Taichi motherboard. From my testing, this thing is just as good as the X399 Taichi motherboard. Of course, you get that shorter distance, however, making it a great solution for people who wanna fit it in a micro ATX motherboard. Of course, there are some compromises, the DDR4 slots being the main one. You do lose a uh, two one-speed PCIe slots, but you do still get three PCIe speed 16 slots, and they are still reinforced to make them stronger, although I've never had a problem with the uh, normal pre-steel solutions. Uh, the SATA ports itself, you do get eight SATA 3 ports and two uh, U.2 slots too. So expandability and options are here on this motherboard, especially for a micro ATX solution. The X399, it does get the approval from me. Of course, though, with X399 motherboards, they are quite expensive. On average, I do believe they are the most expensive motherboards out there at the moment, at least to the high-end desktop consumer market. Anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed this review. If you did, then be sure to hit that like button and let me know in the comment section below what you think about this motherboard. I love reading your thoughts and opinions as always, and I'll catch you in another tech video very soon. So stay tuned. Peace out for now. Bye. I know that's a bit of a marketing term, but you do get three 16-speed slots on the Tai Chi M.
So your one speed slots being something like a naturally aspirated engine, four speed turbocharged, you're getting three supercharged turbo PCIe slots. Now looking at the rear of the motherboard, you get eight, nine, ten, nine. Now look at these ants coming through. Stop biting me, ant. Okay. I don't really 